There we go. There we go. There we go. What happened? I don't know. I had to sign in from um from the web. Uh, I see. Ray, you have my name. <laughs> I think it's because I sent you the link. My bad. Probably You're good. <laughs> I, I'm having a crisis of of uh, identity here. Identity. <laughs> <laughs> There's two Phillips. Yeah. Hey, Allegra. Hi. How are you? Doing good. How about you? Pretty good. Um, I know Deborah is about to join us. She was just getting to her office where her internet is more stable. Um, it's there. <laughs> that is an issue. It is. <laughs> hey, Lizette. Um, How do I change my name? It should be under the, the three <laughs> dots when you go on your self and then you can go to rename. Got it. Ray, you didn't make it home? I I left for a little bit. Okay. I wasn't gonna be able to get all the way home. So I'm back hanging out. About I'm back 30 hanging out. I... 30 minutes ago for me. <laughs> I did what you did, Camille. You were trying to leave early, and I just kept getting things pushed on me. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to go. <laughs> yes, same. <laughs> Came home and a whole lot more. Okay, so Lisette has joined. the gallery up. Not heard anything from Everold to say yay or nay that he would be here. Um, but if we don't have, even if we don't have everybody, we're not voting on anything so we can still hear information tonight. I think I just learned something. That's I didn't know that that was a that, that was a stipulation. Um, we've had a rec commission has had numbers issues a couple of times, and we and and we I don't know if we were voting. I think we probably were voting, so it doesn't matter one way or another. But I think once or twice in my three years, we have we have said, okay, we'll reconvene. We'll send out a a new meeting date if we didn't meet quorum. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm learning. We we always are learning, I think. <laughs> um, Definitely. <laughs> so maybe I'll just read the thing that I have to read and start the meeting at 636. This is the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee meeting. Um, it is October 9th. We have another Philip. <laughs> Everybody is Philip tonight. That's my fault, everybody. I, the way that I shared the link was for sure my link. Sorry. Oh, and okay. So we are all here. Um, so I was just about to read the thing that I read. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, so we will go over any announcements and then we'll have member reports, public comment, standing items of Crest, DEI, Rob, and Youth Empowerment updates. And we do have Ray Harp from the Recreation Department here to talk a little bit about Youth Empowerment. Um, then comments and questions sent to Town Manager, goals discussion, presenting at Town Council meeting, upcoming agenda items and meeting schedule, public comment, anything we didn't reasonably anticipate, and adjournment. Um, so does anybody have any announcements? No. Or a member Just report. a little one. Oh, oh, you have an announcement. Yeah. Okay, let's set. Oh, I do. Hi, all. Um, 
just a little quick announcement. So can you hear me fine? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so at Meadowview, which it's what used to be Renew, which used to be South Point, um, there's a going to be a costume parade on Tuesday, I think October 29th at 5 p.m. Um, I just got the email today from the office manager and it's going to be a parade with, you know, kids and and whatnot. But I guess at the end, there are some organizations that will be there um, handing out candy. I'm not too sure what the organizations are, um, but I was, um, since I got the email today late on, I will be inquiring from the manager um, to see if an organization could be like a committee. Wait, I couldn't, we couldn't hear you, Allegra. Oh, that sounds like a cool little community event and a perhaps way to, if, if committee members would be available and welcome to a way to go into one of the neighborhoods that we've been talking about doing some outreach into. When is that again, Lisette? October 29th. Could you um after this meeting just share it on with us on the on the just send it to us so we have it? Yes. All right, thanks. Announcements. Member reports. Um, so I guess I have some some reports. Um, one uh, is to say that we do have a, a new member for CSSJC, which is exciting. Um, uh, myself and others took part in kind of interviews, and um, Dr. Pat Romney will be joining us. Um, she's already been voted in by the town council on Monday, and then um, She's, you know, you know, she has to get sworn in all of those things, but we'll be able to invite her for our, our next meeting. Um, and then during this past month too, uh, we did to do interviews with two other people. Um, and then we'll wait on, on the outcome of that and appointments for the next month with that too. But hopefully we'll, we'll be, um, we'll have full membership in soon, which will be exciting for us to, to have. So that would be really cool. Um, the other thing, someone from the community did uh, let me know um, about the parking situation in, in Amherst. I guess what's going on is that um, it's not just this person, but others uh, that they kind of use the parking um, app in, in, in Amherst. And then um, what happens is that they get, even though they pay for the, the parking, they get tickets. And then afterwards, it's almost like the town is getting like double dipped, like they're paying through the app and then then getting tickets and then being told that they have to kind of like appeal and all this other stuff. So this is someone obviously, you know, a BIPOC person, BIPOC people, they don't have the money for this. They don't have the time for this in terms of appeals and um, and paying. Uh, so I just want to put it out there because I said I would I would share what's going on. Um, with the town, um, with the town manager and with those that are listening, town council and everything that that needs to be uh, dealt with because um, no one needs to be getting, uh, you know, double cited and, and get fees um, when they've done exactly what they were supposed to do, right? Which was use the app, pay, and now they're getting ticketed. Um, this has been happening, I guess, over and over again. Pers the, the person and people have complained and they're not getting any resolution and that's why they, they're coming to us um, because obviously that is not a good thing. So hopefully um, that will get addressed. I know I've had issues with the parking thing myself. Uh, when I use my card, sometimes it doesn't work. I always have to use change. So I think, you know, you are, I think Amherst kind of automation and machines need to be looked at <laughs> because obviously something's not working. Um, because I can I can attest to um, some issues that that occurred along those lines. Um, 
The other thing, I just know that there's, you know, a lot of, I've met with a variety of different community people um, throughout the month uh, who are just concerned, you know, across the board um, around some of CSWG's um, recommendations and how long they're taking and so on. And so on. Uh, but we can talk about that during the agenda. Uh, but just to say that, obviously, um, we are the pulse, right? This committee, com uh, com uh, community people come to us, talk to us, let us know what's going on. And that's why we then talk about it on a monthly basis. And that's why we have a lot of questions and inquiries because that's the expectation, right? We're the, we're the committee that deals with um, inclusion, diversity, equity, safety for Amherst. So we are the ones that need to ask these questions. And I'm just making a point to say it because I know that a lot of people don't like that we ask questions and that we inquire, but that is the, the point of CSSJC, so. member reports. Public comment. I do see four attendees in the audience. Um, if you would like to make a comment, you can use the raise hand feature and we will bring you into the room. Um, there will also be an additional public comment period at the end of the meeting. So if you don't have anything to say yet, but you have something to say later, we will give you another opportunity to speak. Hands up right now. So we can move on to the agenda items. Um, and we'd love to start with Ray um, to hear a little bit about the town's efforts towards youth empowerment. Well, I, I think I, I want to kind of, you know, like back it up a little bit. So Ray, hi. Uh, thank you so much Hello. for agreeing to, to, to come and, and meet with us. Um, and, you know, of course, I want to turn it over to you and, you know, let you like introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, but I also want to tell you a little bit about us, right? We're, we're the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. Um, we're the committee that has been tasked, um, well, the, the, the kind of follow-up committee from the Community Safety Working Group that made all of the, those different recommendations that established CRESS, established the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Department, and we made several recommendations. One of it was an establishment of uh, a youth empowerment center, which would be youth, um, BIPOC youth-led, right, and uh, a safe haven for BIPOC youth, but obviously service all youth, right, uh, a youth empowerment center that would focus on a variety of different activities, for young people, um, theater, arts, uh, sports, um, you know, also um, homework help or tutoring and things like that, and a variety of different things, but really a safe haven, a place that would be in in town to find a space in town where pe where young people could go. And this, we, we were able to make that recommendation because we had heard from a variety of young people that, that that was a need. We also recommended an establishment of a multicultural center and we recommended uh, an establishment of a resident oversight board, which would be a board that would be in place so that if anyone has complaints around the Amherst Police Department, then they could go to that uh, resident oversight board, which would be an, uh, made up of independent group of people to be able to um, you know, file the complaint and have an independent process to deal with, with issues. Um, and so we also, uh, our other um, group to advise, um, you know, the town manager, town council, town departments around these issues, around equity, inclusion, diversity, um, safety um, in, in Amherst. Uh, we're also, you know, will uh, advise and, and ask questions around the budget um, and we'll be here to monitor and help and any issues that come up, um, you know, in terms of dealing with, um, equity, inclusion, diversity, safety, we're the ones that we'll be uh, bringing up and the community brings these issues to us. So um, several, it was in August, there was a meeting and we got some clarity that for me, you know, and a lot of our members, we thought that the youth empowerment was under the diversity, equity, inclusion department. So DEI department, right? Which uh, Philip is, is representing today and Pamela Young is the director. Throughout this 
year, two years, I guess the 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 the, the focus is that now DEI deals with some youth programming, but they're not in charge of establishing the youth empowerment center, right? And then we've been told by the town manager, because we asked some questions, we were told that now the youth empowerment center and the establishment of that is under recreation, which would be you and the finance director, okay? So then based on that conversation, uh, myself and Allegra, we decided to invite you and the finance director. But there was a little bit of a mix up with that because I ended up inviting was Holly Drake, I believe, who I guess was interim finance director when the last one left. And then there's a new one, Melissa something, I forget her name right now. I apologize for forgetting her last name. And so now we've been in touch with her. And so what we've done is invite her to the next meeting because that's what I we were told that now Youth Empowerment Center is under both of, of, of your, your and Melissa's department. Um, the other question and the other thing that we'd like you to address is that supposedly there's this group unnamed that is meeting, discussing a, a youth empowerment center and establishment of a youth empowerment center. And so we wanna get more information about that. I know that Camille is part of it, F Philip is part of it. Um, we've heard maybe the Donahue Institute is facilitating discussions. Um, we know that Youth Empowerment Center has $500,000. We want to know a variety of different things in terms of what is going on and, and really what the situation is in regards to that. So again, thank you so much for coming. And um, yeah, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and then kind of go into the into some of those questions. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I don't have a I don't have any sort of a, a presentation prepared for you. I don't I haven't prepared any any uh, report for you, so to speak. Um, this is very new for me because I think that some of the timeline that you share there is I, like I'm not on that timeline. There, like you you presented a a, 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 a description of of like the flow of of responsibility over the course of the three-year life of this of this uh mission that i that, that i haven't been involved with the whole time but uh but i'm sure that'll come up in our conversation later on um uh again thank you for having me uh, uh i'm ray harp i have been the director of recreation here for three years uh you know i've got a long i came to recreation from a long uh career in the schools and teaching, working with working with young people of all ages in a variety of different ways in the classroom, out of the classroom. Uh, you know, my my life energy is largely built around uh, ideas touching upon youth empowerment for a variety of different a variety of different individuals. Um, uh, when I when I took over, it was actually pretty new. My coming aboard was right after the pandemic, which of course shifted a lot of things in the town and shifted a lot of it was the same time, coincidentally in some ways, it was the same time that that uh that some things were happening and changing and some ideas and some possibilities were coming in here. I was I, I came aboard as part of those possibilities. And early on I was I was invited by the finance director to I was basically given the opportunity to to take part in a uh, you know to to manage the five hundred thousand dollar grant that was given to the town of Amherst through ARPA um, and and when he described it as being the uh, the the needs assessment and feasibility study that's looking for that's looking into the uh, uh, the town's a future possibility of, of establishing a youth empowerment center where all those things that uh, uh, Deborah just introduced, those ideas and and perhaps more could be centered out of my, my I didn't hesitate. One of the things, it, it fed my, my educational interests and I, I feared that my job in recreation was going to take me away from some of those interests in some ways. And it was, it was always a mission of mine to make sure that, that, that whatever I do, I'm still adding some of those features into our programming. And so this was a chance in my first few months to, to reestablish what it is that, that drives me as a professional, what drives me as a teacher, what drives me as a recreation director. 
and I wanted to be able to make, see that through, I agreed to take that on. I agreed to make that, uh, you know, sort of my, my first pet project, one of my first pet projects here as the recreation director and got some momentum in that direction. Um, um, and so, so my introduction to youth empowerment, I've been involved in this conversation since basically since the beginning of my time here. Um, uh, I've been, I, it's, it, it was an interest, it remains an interest and in the, and the, and the, over the course of the, of the three-year life of this grant, uh, my department without having the ability to to stand inside of a center and look around and see all the things that have happened. That's not the way things work here in the first place, but it certainly wasn't the way that things worked here for us. Without being able to stand in the middle of a center and say, this is what's going on and decide what what the what the next steps were, we have we have taken on the responsibility of of uh, bringing in programming that I think, speaks to the mission that was very much involved in that CSWG report, which early on in my conversations, a, a number of conversations with the finance director, the former finance or the former finance director, we had a number of conversations about sort of what that charge was. And I've I haven't studied it in a little while. I put it down when I was when I was uh uh, when I stepped away from the, this project a little bit, but I I I did get a chance to look thoroughly into that report and that became my marching orders to some to some extent that became this was the energy I saw the I saw the the, the energy of the community I saw the energy of the the research I was I was impressed by the ways that it that it that it that it, its intent matched up with my intent without without looking at I I haven't been involved in that research here, but my idea of a youth empowerment center and the purpose and the reason behind a youth empowerment center was very, very similar to what I saw in that report. And so I had already linked in to, to some of that energy that that energy was the, was the, my purpose in making this work. So I'm, I am at least somewhat right now familiar with that CSWG report. I have it, I've looked, I've come back to look at it for different reasons over the course of my time here, because I think there was some some strong community energy in there, um, but then I stepped away. I think there were there were some concerns that recreation was involved in the very beginning of that project, so I stepped away from the project. It wasn't it, uh, uh, about about why it was under recreation, about where the where that interest was, and I I, I was out of that conversation for oh, I was marginally in the conversation just as sort of what do you think about this but I took myself out of the conversation when when a number of different factors came in uh, and so where we are right now is I've continued consistently to be looking for ways to do youth empowerment programming to do programming that that made sense for my department made sense for for the town of Amherst and made sense for the for the mission that was in that uh, uh, CSWG report. Um, uh, my department and I have made uh, you know, a, a mission, a, a follow up mission of of putting youth empowerment programming into our into play, and we have the beginnings of, of some very very I think important and strong work that a lot of people have put put in some work to try and to try and accomplish. And there's more stuff to come. Um, uh, but but in terms of the reason why, and I apologize because I know I took a couple of days to reply to the invite to come back here. One of the reasons is because the 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 uh, uh, the assumption that I was in charge of this, I didn't want to assume any responsibility that I don't have, and so and so my my being here, I've I've I I am authorized as a as a as a staff member who has an interest in the future of youth empowerment programming here, but I am not in I am not responsible for the five hundred thousand dollar grant money. Um, that's on the table. That's on the table. Um, you know, you know, that's. I think that's my 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 best introduction for you as to what brings me to this room tonight, to to this meeting tonight. What brings me in here, and hopefully as as an engine of of progress and make as an engine of making something happen in our collective future. Uh, I'm 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 here 
because of that, uh, my I'd be happy to answer any questions about about sort of what uh, you know, uh, I, I guess any any questions that I can answer that I that I uh, have the place and authority to answer. I'd be happy to answer any questions about myself and about my own interests and about sort of where we're going from here is the best that I can offer you here in a in a in a in a going forward perhaps a more official capacity but but there's only so much I can answer about where we have been so um I I have some questions in terms of of you know and and you know again thank you for just coming and and talking with us um, yeah, there wasn't any expectation that you would do any formal presentation or anything like that. We're just excited oh, yeah. that you were able to come out um, because, like I said, we haven't really been getting um, too much um, responses to our questions. Um, and we've posed questions to uh, the town manager and, and, you know, it hasn't been as clear in terms of things. But um, as you stated, right, the, the, the recommendation that CSWG, and I was part of the CSWG as an original member of CSWG, and now, you know, part of CSSAC. So when we created that recommendation for the Youth Empowerment Center, as you stated, it was very intentional, right? It's very much because we need a place to empower our young people, and especially BIPOC young people, and those who are marginalized in, in this community. And so we wanted something that really was going to focus in and, and start you know, and, and get that 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 emphasis, that mission um, accomplished. And so um, our recommendation was made, made uh, you know, in 2021, we're in 2024 now, right? Um, and so there's been a lot of like, you know, juggling around in terms of where, you know, the youth, youth empowerment center is. So for me, I guess my question is, so you said you were involved in it before, but now I, so I guess just more clarity, like, so are you involved? I, I do, do you share this with the, the finance director? I mean, are you officially helping out with YEC or no? I mean, I guess, I don't know. So who is in charge of the $500,000? The five hundred thousand dollars is once uh, again. There were multiple reasons why I stepped out of the direction. One of them was was uh, community pressure. I I I know, and I've been on I've been on multiple sides. I don't want to say both sides of the issue, but I've been on multiple sides of these conversations in town. And I completely, with respect, stepped back because I thought my and recreations being involved was a complication for the issue. And so early on, I, 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 I said, you know, I, that's not, I don't need to, I don't need to be in charge of this, of, of this piece of it. Um, and, and the town moved it back into the, into the our grants manager's hands. That's the finance department. Okay. The finance department was responsible for that. Um, okay. And the, in the wake of, of a bunch of other things happening and, and, I can't speak with any official record as to the decisions that were made because I stepped out. I'm not in that conversation. I'm not in the in the mechanical conversation about that right now. But but I can I can tell you that that uh, it was a I'm sure it was a challenge in the in the finance department with their changing staff with their with you know when their finance director left. When the former finance director left, then then now having it removed from recreation and now in a in a department, a finance department that was in flux, that makes it a lot more difficult to 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 manage that that money. There, I know that there were efforts to try and do that. I know there were efforts. I was I was marginally involved again in conversations with people that were that were in it, but that was not my responsibility. I, I had energy for it at one point. It was my thing at one point, but that wasn't. I have a bunch of different things as a director that honestly I probably should have been looking at when I was for the months that I was in charge of the of the uh, project in the first place. Um, uh, and so and so then when we're looking at managing that, it, it was originally placed under recreation. It was moved out of recreation because. Uh, 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 it was moved back out of recreation into the into the finance department to manage that, and now we're at the stage where we have to figure out what we're doing with the with that grant money. Um, 
Yeah, because I mean, that's one of the things that Paul got back to us. He said that I guess the this grant money needs to be um, expended because I have his response right in front of me by December 31st of, of 2024. Well, no, it has to be committed by, by December 31st, 2024, and then expended by December 31st, 2026. So, you know, December is right around the corner. <laughs> it needs to be committed right. by then. I, I'm I'm wondering what does this commitment look like, right? Um, you know, so if it's in the the the, the you know in the bailiwick of the finance department, um, that's why we wanted to talk to the finance director. But if, yeah, so, like I said, but we it was our mistake. You know, made the mistake yeah. of not sure because of all of the changes. Who was the the one that was actually the finance director? So we have invited her, you know, for our next meeting, and hopefully she'll attend so that we can get some clearer. Um, information regards to it. But I guess my second follow-up question, and then I'll I'll let you know other CSJC members also ask questions, is okay, so is there stuff going on in terms of like a group meetings taking place around a fe feasibility study assessment? Because I think you mentioned that. So are there meetings going on? Um and you know what are those meetings about? What's being talked about? Because, you know, like I said, I've, I've heard that Phil and Camille is part of it. I, I'm just wondering why a member of CSSGC wasn't invited to any of these meetings, since we are the, the, the group tasked to kind of look at these issues and make sure that CSWG's recommendations are actually implemented and, and monitored and, and, you know, and successful. So, so what is going on? <laughs> I guess. I, uh, I I think there's one piece I, I know I did hear your second part of your question was, OK, what's the the, the, the group and the meeting sort of stuff that I believe you're uh, I don't know what I can clear up about that. But I can tell you this, that uh, before I before I address that, um, the, the five hundred thousand uh, dollar youth empowerment center grant, which I hate the fact that the word center is in it because I think that set a, a standard, I think that set a bar for us that that I don't think was intended, but I think it was misplaced. It was early to place the center in there, in that grant, because $500,000, the, the intention for me, I what I felt in the beginning was that, that, that the, the end goal was to find a center here, but it was not. I think it may have confused some people and said that that $500,000 goes into a center. That $500,000 grant was a grant that was set up specifically for a needs assessment and feasibility study. Um, that's what I was. That's what I was asked to do. If the needs assessment, and feasibility study, uh, the needs assessment is a smaller piece of that. The feasibility study is a huge piece of that. Uh, um, and my, I can speak as I'm going to try and go back in time as my managing this this grant. My my intention was to was to explore all of the uh, obstacles. Uh, challenges to explore all of the different uh, uh, potential funding sources, uh, comparisons in terms of other uh, youth centers uh, that were run municipally, that were run in the private sector, that were run in uh, the, the, basically the, the concepts of a youth empowerment center to see what was possible in an Amherst youth center. Um, $500,000, as I believe that you all probably know, is not going to build your building. That's not going to build your building, and that five hundred thousand dollars also is is something that is uh, uh, you know it's it, because it's limited to the life of the grant. It also doesn't answer the 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 issue about long term funding of the program and its programs. Uh, the the recommendations about salaries, about about vehicles, about program expansion, the, rec the, the recommendations that came with the CSWG report and naturally are attached to, to uh, any conversations that, that Amherst or any other town would have to have about building, a, a building something of this significance and magnitude. We can't afford, Amherst can't afford to, to throw a sensor out there and, and have it fall apart because there's not a plan for its future. So that feasibility study that that I think is the most important piece of that $500,000 grant uh, uh, was that feasibility study was essential to figuring out 
how to put a program like this, how to put a center if that's if that is the end goal, but how to get put programming like this in place that could survive over the course of years and years and years. Uh, um, you know, to, to have the life of this is more than, um, I believe there was uh, more than a million dollars. I know it wasn't, uh, it wasn't verbatim, but there was a million dollars or more of salary that were suggested in the CSWG report. And that doesn't come from nowhere. Programming, of course, recreation directors, some of the, some of the, pro some of the things that we looked at as being pie in the sky, things that will happen in a in a in a youth empowerment center. Some of the things that 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 I spoke to people who were involved. Uh, uh, I spoke to some people uh, uh, about sort of planning out of, of, of moving ourselves towards towards this. I I, I believe that uh, you know our 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 the the same vision that I think was in the CSWG report that that inspired me to be involved in the, in the process altogether. Those things happen. Some of them are recreational. Some of them are definitely not. And, and uh, um, you know, some of them are definitely not sort of underneath my umbrella as a rec director. But the idea is to, is to find a space and programming a place where these things can happen, that the town can figure out how to how to make that part remember of course the dei and crest were also infants at that time um, uh, uh, but our uh, our intention in building this building the structures here we're we're trying to say if we were going to if we're going to uh, spend this much money and, and commit ourselves to this much money yearly how can we make that work how can we make how can we make a youth empowerment center and all the costs now and in the future of that? How can we make that work and not set ourselves up for failure? Um, and that's a much harder task than even than certainly than I thought going into it. I know that there were challenges in in my time of of being in charge of that, but uh, you know that was that was a much more uh, complicated, complex uh, uh, planning process than I think. Uh, that that I or the former finance director had in mind when we were brought in, um, uh, it was complicated by other issues about about our our uh, you know our, our our partnerships and that sort of thing. But we were we were definitely looking into trying to make those visions happen for the center, make, happen for the town of Amherst. Um, in terms, uh, and, and so I just want to, uh, the first part of my response to that question is uh, to make sure it's very clear that that the the grant was not for, was not to open a youth empowerment center. That's not the, that's not what the grant money was for. And I, and I wasn't involved in messaging that to anybody here. I've had the conversation with colleagues of mine that, that, that I think it was, was, uh, enlightening to understand that that the birth of this of this grant was not about taking five hundred thousand dollars and saying go uh, hey recre amherst recreation take this five hundred thousand dollars and make a rec make a empowerment center and then and then see what happens that five hundred thousand dollars expires and then we have nothing um the grant was for needs assessment and a and a feasibility study so that we could so that we could move in the direction of that of that empowerment center. It doesn't happen with a $500,000 grant. Uh, that center doesn't happen there. Um, I can I can try and answer. I don't I don't know what I can give you on it, but I can try and answer the the uh second part of your question. Is there anything that you want to ask about what I just said there? The the second part of your question I have, is about a, I have a ton of questions, but I'm gonna let my other CSSJC members so I don't like take up all the all the airspace. So y'all y'all follow up some questions. If not, I will. <laughs> so, Ray, um, given that this was just a feasibility study and post CSWG work group, what has the town done in terms of that study? In terms of this, in terms of the which study? How how was it? How has the town spent five hundred thousand? Um. The town right now and spending down the money, two things that I believe may have been shared with you uh, are the 
uh, are, uh, and I, it was in some of the questions I think that you all have had in the past here. Uh, uh, one of them is a, is a, uh, it's a, it's a inventory, uh, it's a physical space inventory. Um, we are looking at, at an inventory of buildings that we have. Again, that works down the line for us to eventually be able to find, um, find space that might work for us. Uh, uh, looking at the spaces that are, uh, looking at the spaces that are, are that the town owns, the town owns, the, the physical space that the town owns and operates, something like, uh, I think the easy one for me to say, because it's something that's on a lot of people's minds. I don't think I'm, like, if, if people are asking what happens with Wildwood, the question is, Wildwood is shutting down because of certain reasons. What happens if 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 the wildwood is going to be repurposed and used for something else? Then then we are using that money to get a full physical survey of the space that we own and operate. Mm -hmm. um, some of those spaces could eventually be repurposed for for youth empowerment for the per, for the for the meaning of re youth empowerment. So this is basically getting an inventory on all of our physical spaces and all of our building spaces, especially those that that may be of of interest for us. Um, the second part is, I know you all have heard about it, is the, you know, the intent to try and do a, 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 a programming inventory uh, of, 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 of town programs. I wasn't, I'm not involved in collecting that information, so I can't speak to any, any of the details about that collection process. I can tell you as somebody who is now interested in, in, uh, and, 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 you know, open to to being involved in the future of this of this idea the idea of youth empowerment center uh exists long beyond the the life of this grant of course before and after the, the life of this grant and and my wanting to be involved in the next phases of this uh i, I can tell you that it is useful for me to have a to have a full programming inventory uh, and able to, it's, it's, it's a living, a, a living inventory of programs available for, uh, for, for involved for kids in the, in a target age that are trying to get involved that want to have things to do that, that the town needs beyond youth empowerment, but certainly it helps us for, for figuring out uh, you know, directions of programming inside of a, of a future youth empowerment center uh, to find out all the programs that exist in this town uh, that's that cater to or speak to the target audience. Um, and so that that uh, inventory, that programming inventory uh, uh, that was conducted that that is in the process of being conducted by Donahue, is something that is that that I think is useful for me for for a bunch of different reasons, um, uh, but in the in the overarching long long term the goals here, it is it has a limited and important role in giving us inventory information to move forward. So, do we have an inventory of available programs for in the town? that is uh that is in process right now that's and that is what that's what the uh that's that's what the donahue institute helped us with in terms of gathering that information from public private from uh town schools public private trying to collect opportunities collect programming opportunities for for amherst youth and and i ask this question understand that you may not be able to answer but given that this ARPA funds was just for a study, um, is there any commitment, any financial commitment on the part of the town to actually fund a youth empowerment center? I can't answer that. I do not know of any of any commitment into funding a youth empowerment center. I can tell you as a matter of, I believe, fact that $500,000 doesn't 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 lock in there in terms of the commitment to, to the youth empowerment. I think the town is committed to our ideas of pursuing youth empowerment through programming. Um, uh, I can't speak to whether or not the town has officially authorized, officially committed money towards the youth empowerment center. Thank you. Thank you.
Others with questions? Lisette, Allegra? I guess I'm just wondering a little bit more about what recreation has been able to provide in terms of empowerment so far and what it might, if it, if it considers itself a future partner in this endeavor. So again, what, what, what the recreation department has offered already in terms of youth empowerment programming um, during this time period. Happy to. Um, uh, we have a, a combination of different partnerships. We're doing uh, one, uh, one partnership is uh, with CRESS, APD, and Responders is our RISE program, which was based out of our, our own, uh, uh, out of our recreation grant. We've paid for that out of our recreation grant for programming. It is a uh, it's it's completely voluntary uh, on the part of a small number of students. Um, uh, it's it has uh, it has a, a, a I think a, a very progressive empowering sort of uh, a mission behind it, which is to try and get kids who in many ways are are you know may through in school or in you know out of school who may who may self-identify or have been identified as people who are as young people who are it's almost like a like a classic diversionary sort of sort of conversation but it's something much more and goes beyond that it's a it is a uh, uh, it's a it's a weekly seminar run by the rise program the ross institute uh out of boston which is basically looking at some some uh um, you know uh, at, the, at the issues of trying to trying to trying to build identity inside of kids and build connections for them within their communities. We had our first pilot program with that last spring. And the, the, I think there was some really, really powerful, we, we, it's a series of workshop conversations. It's a series of, 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 of you know, identity exploration. It is some, some uh, partner teamwork sort of things. It's basically ongoing retreat activity to get kids to think about themselves and their space and community and their identity and to challenge themselves while they're challenging those people who are invested in them and building building relationships relationships inside i know that uh we were we were very very fortunate to have uh you know some incredible partners from those from our town agencies including CRESS, including apd we had we had uh some some very very focused and 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 uh, mission based uh relationship based uh, 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 uh creative community building that was going on in that program and uh you know as we get ready to start our second year here soon, I, 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 I would like to obviously put in a plug for my department and just say that the second year is is uh, is intending to be stronger, better. Is in it? We intend to have that. Uh, uh, you know, the, the the response and the feedback from kids was that this is something that we want. This is something that we need. This is something that we look to do on Saturday mornings. It's early Saturday morning sort of thing, and it could be a drag for a lot of us. The more the uh, uh, morning movement and mentoring program, which is our larger and sort of higher profile uh, 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 program that's run in cooperation with the family center at the schools. Um, uh, we helped, it's a, a school initiative from two or three years ago where they started bringing kids in, small number of kids started coming into school before before the, the start of the school day. Um, they came in to basically, to basically uh, get into the school early, kids with attendance issues. I think it sort of started with kids that had attendance issues and trying to get them to school early uh, and get them sort of moving around and get them active. Uh, before the school day starts. Uh, uh, we came to them last year and they welcomed us with ARPA grant money to expand their program, to provide busing for a larger number of kids to come in and to provide programming that looks at 
uh, tutoring, mentoring. They do some some uh, building. Uh, they do some field ship building. They have partnerships outside of the Amherst Public Schools. We have the colleges that come involved to do some uh, uh, basically mentorship and training with with kids. Some of it is athletic, getting in a gym and shooting and playing. Some of it is we do some uh, craft work on the side. We do some. The UMass cheerleading group came in to run some things with a bunch of our kids, and they weren't all sort of uh, cheerleading, uh, cheerleading uh, hopefuls, but to do some, to do some stunts and do some, do some activities with the UMass cheerleading team, UMass football, UMass basketball, UMass field hockey, a bunch of UMass athletes come in and it's a chance to sort of uh, talk about people and, and building goals, building, building up there. It's a mentorship program that I think also is in its early stages and evolving into something that's, that's, bigger and stronger. We have a, a number outside of this, uh, outside of this ARPA grant, we are now in the process of looking for uh, funding and life beyond the grant, because if we don't, then it has to shrink back down again. And we have a lot of, a lot of community, uh, a lot of community interest in providing us with funding to keep that program moving. It is a, a it's one of the most dynamic things that we've put in place. Um, there's 40 kids on any given day that are going to school an hour and a half early. Uh, presentation at the school committee. We had there were parents that were that were uh, uh, parent. Uh, there were parents that were that were incredibly thankful and and. Um, you know, we're speaking about what sort of impact it has on their kids in terms of in terms of building a confidence, building an ownership of their own space in the schools and letting kids go in there and feel like this is space. One of the big issues that I think we find with uh, students of color, maybe in particular, is sometimes when you're in these institutions where even if the numbers are, are a little bit more friendly than, you know, maybe they're more friendly in Amherst than they are in other areas. One of the things we find with students of color is that ownership of the space is a challenge if it's, if you're in a white institution, if you are in a institution where the, where the teacher's faces are not yours, if you're in an institution where it feels like you're learning stuff that's not yours. And so one of the things that I think I think is 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 under the surface and makes this program so so useful so vital and why i think so many people are looking to try and find how they can invest and volunteer and get their get get in to help us out with this is because the amount of ownership that kids have over the schools where they operate is impressive um, and so again my staff has put a lot of hard work into looking at these things it's not all of like like all of our views of what youth empowerment looks like in the long run. All of us have have ideas of youth empowerment that go well beyond that. But those two programs in particular are ones that speak to a very specific uh, 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 purpose of youth empowerment. One one particular aspect of youth empowerment they they speak to they speak to a focused part of why this project was so important to me. When it was presented to me, um, we're looking at building. A, we're looking at building right now a a, a, a youth entrepreneurship uh, program that was that that uh, Philip and I have been talking about, have been discussing about, um, and and we actually have have like, we've made some concrete inroads into making that happen for us here in the spring. Uh, DEI and recreation are both share a a. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, an interest in in building uh, literacy interest and and uh, uh, skills in the area of 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 of, of building business, building business instinct of of running a business, and I and part of that is working through that getting involved. Uh, uh, getting involved business folks from the area to come in and help us. But we have the tracks already in place between DEI and recreation. We have the tracks in place right now to make a program that I think, you know, all of our programs and our ideals are something that we, we think will be something. But I think that can really be a part of our programming going forward and speak to specific things that aren't I don't want to say just because we do some fantastic things with ball and sports, the ball, you know, ball and sports sort of stuff. Uh, but but it it is not ball and sports stuff 
it is not it's not uh if if there are images of what recreation is these are things that transcend uh you know sort of sort of recreation is a place where 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 rec kids can go out there and do rec sports and they have a good time out there um these are ways for us to build community and build build integrity and build uh build some 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 control over future i'm talking too much Thank you for any other questions. Sorry, Allegra. I was just saying thank you for, I think that was a very thorough description of some of the programs that we've kind of heard mentioned. So I appreciate that. I'm very proud of those programs as my staff is also very proud of the programming, the kids, you know, the, the kids that are involved. It's not all the kids, but it's a, a large amount. There's 65 kids enrolled in morning movement. Uh, Uh, and there's a wait list. Uh, you know, I say, you know, I say that they are our best, our best advocates, and they're coming to school at seven o'clock in the morning, and they don't have to start class until eight thirty. I, I think, uh, or nine o'clock. They don't have to start class until nine o'clock. Their, I, I think, their buy-in is is uh, speaks enough about about sort of what meaning it has for them and their community. Their families certainly will speak for. Lisa, do you have any questions? Because if not, I have some follow-up questions. Uh, no, my questions have been getting answered. Um, Ray, you know, obviously, and I know about the morning movement. I've actually known about it um, for a long time and how it even started. Um, so I didn't know, though, that REC had kind of, you know, that you all are being supportive of it. Because I know before it was more kind of like, you know, group of teachers and, and or volunteers that kind of started it very small. And and all that, because my son was a middle schooler. He's a high school right now. So a lot of his buddies went to the uh, morning movement and everything. Um, so I, I'm very... May I clarify uh, really quickly that that it is a school program, like the schools. I don't want to, I want to make it very clear on the record here that that that's not our, uh, it is their idea. And that's as important as any other part of this. But recreation's role, and it's not a small part, it's a very big part, is in investing and expanding that and putting more eyes on it and allowing it to have a, a bigger life in the future. But we are very, very proud of what we've done there and the schools. It's, it's, I, I credit uh, uh, Dr. Marta Guevara and, and her staff over there for, for giving that seat. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarity because, yeah, I wasn't sure now whether it had gotten taken over or, or what have you, but a, more partnership then with the Very schools so. and things like that. Um, and obviously, yeah, I'm I'm excited about that. That's that's great, you know. And I think you know, program that programming that can get done in the meantime, um, is wonderful. But I think I want to clarify because, like I said, I was on part of the CSWG, the original group, and we we did and we do say, and our recommendation is for a center, right? Um, we do want a center. We want a center that is a safe space for, um, you know, uh, all children, all young people, but especially BIPOC young people, and we want it to be BIPOC led, right? Youth led, BIPOC youth led. Right. So I think, yeah, the programming is wonderful, but it's not BIPOC youth led. Right. Um, the pro uh, programming is wonderful, but it's not, you know, kind of, you know, even though it, it is helpful and it's empowering some some young people of color, but it's not, you know, BIPOC youth kind of focus and stuff like that. So we were very intentional and we are very intentional in terms of what it is that we are asking for. And we are asking for a center and we are asking for a safe space because a lot of spaces in town that allegedly say they're safe space for, for BIPOC youth are not safe space for, for BIPOC youth, right? So we're looking for a, a center, a space in town that would actually be dedicated for that. And I understand, and I'm happy. Uh, listen, you have been the first person from town to actually give us some answers. So kudos to you. I'm really excited about you right now <laughs> because we haven't gotten as much clarity from anyone else up until this point. So I'm very excited about the fact that you've explained that the $500,000 is actually for feasibility study and an assessment feasibility study. Wow, great. Thankfully, someone has told us that because it was a lot of fudging around, not really coming forward, not really saying it, not really, okay, so $500,000 for that. And you've kind of broken down why it is, 
But the point of the matter is if that $500,000 is for feasibility and assessment, then where is the other money going to come for the actual center, right? Because for us too, we don't want the delay tactics. We don't want those types of things. We want to actually see the timeline and see the deadline, right? The timeline to the deadline <laughs> to the when is it going to actually happen type of situation as opposed to, you know, kind of like, you know, these half information, not full, you know, um, sentences in terms of what's happening. Um, and that, like you said, the Donahue Institute is the one that's doing this feasibility study. Thank you for telling us that because we've kind of heard may, of it. May I correct? May I correct? Donahue is not doing a feasibility study. Well, assessment. They're this, doing, the assessment. They're, they're doing okay. survey inventory of programming, which is not the same thing. So as okay, so, so right now we're at the stage of, and that's what I want to be very clear, right? Because I guess it's still not very clear. So right now we're at the stage of assessment. So part of the money then is being used to assess part of the 500,000, or you wouldn't know that. Or would it be the finance director that would know whether part of that money is being used to assess? I, I can tell you that that part of the of that grant money is being used to assess physical space and programming. Okay, so that part of it is being used to assess. And then uh, the other part will be for the feasibility study, right? The next step will be feasibility study. I cannot speak to that. Okay. Um, All right. So that could be something that we'll we'll talk to the town manager then or and or the finance department because they'd be able to tell us, right? I I I mean I would assume so. Okay. <clears throat> um because I you know the town manager did say that there's supposed to be a commitment done by December thirty first. So that's why I'm asking all these questions because we really want to know what this money is being used for, you know, right now, at least we have a, a, a sense that it's, as it's at an assessment stage. So I guess the other part would be, um, are you involved in this assessment stage too with, with, with others, I guess, uh, like this unnamed group with others? <laughs> so um, I can tell you the unnamed group, I know that that's the, that's the hanging piece here. Yeah. There's not a there's not a, a a committee that's been formed as staff. We're we're uh, Phillips is a staff member. I'm a staff member. Camille's a staff member. We have mm -hmm. uh, Donahue's not at the table talking about talking about uh, uh, feasibility for the for the Youth Empowerment Center. Um, um, we are talking. There are members of the staff, which the three of us here right now have all been in discussions about what what can we do about programming. We are talking. For me, I needed to I need to make sure that I was talking about uh, uh, programming. I wanted to make sure that we're talking about if if uh, you know whatever happens and whatever is happening with that grant. We wanted to make sure that there is that there's a commitment to programming that we can do. So the things that we're doing in recreation are, are sort of what I'm bringing to the table and saying, can we find some way to continue to do this? Can we find some way to expand on programming here? Can we, can we look at ways to do this? I've talked with Philip about some of these and that is that is and and sort of joining with DEI. And, and so Philip, Camille and I have sat down and spoken about some of our intentions here, but in terms of programming interests, I could be your guy in terms of in terms of these are the things that we're trying to do in the direction of 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 youth programming, um, you know. And so so separating myself from the grant, I can tell you that that, that the commitment that I have is in finding space for programming, um, finding finding space and finding some vitality for programming. That means recreation programming, but that also means programming that transcends. Uh, sort of what would be traditional recreation. All right. Um, so I guess next steps, right? What would be the next steps in terms of the, the okay, so there's an assessment going on for the youth center, there's programming going on, um, and then there's our group, right? The CSSJC, that is the group that was tasked for, you know, seeing the the fruition of of the the YEC the youth empowerment center and and being implemented and then monitoring right and so what would be the next steps because we're not getting information 
obviously. And so that's why, again, I'm very grateful for you for coming and actually, you know, sharing some information because we're not getting information from, from the town, unfortunately. And we're, we're being um, kept in the dark, which obviously leads to mistrust, right, from the community because we are, you know, people come to us to ask these questions. And so when, when we're not getting answers to the questions, there's mistrust, right? And that's why we always say the town should be transparent because then it, you deal and then you build trust, right, with the community when you're transparent and you talk about what's going on. So therefore, what are the next steps is, okay, how are we going to, as CSSJC, continue to have information in terms of the youth empowerment center, right? Whatever stage it's at. So, and when I say youth empowerment center, I say the umbrella, right? Youth programming, assessment, feasibility study, whatever stage, that's all our bailiwick. That's all our umbrella, right? So how are we gonna get that information? Um, should you be coming to our meetings to report to us? Because DEI, Pamela was very clear last time that she's not involved in the Youth Empowerment Center and that DEI is involved in some programming, and you've alluded to that, right? Um, but that's it, right? So we need to be informed of what is going on. So how do we get that information? Boy, I wish I could share with you. I, first of all, you don't have to apologize for keeping the word center in your conversation. I, uh, my, I know that's a that's a target goal of yours. It's a it's a target goal of mine. I would love to see that. I just can't speak to it. It's not part of my. It's not part of my marching orders right now. Um, the uh, uh, in terms of in terms of the order that that. Uh, you know, sort of next steps. How do you get that? I'm not, uh, I'm not authorized to tell you that I'm going to be able to give you information that I'm not authorized to give you. But I can tell you that, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm, I hear you. I can, I can bring that to my team and find out if there's something that I can share with you, or if there's something that can be shared with you that's very specific. I, I mean, the, the question about the direction towards that youth center. Um, as being the the the, the end goal, I, I mean, I I don't think that's off the table for anybody, but I don't think that's where where uh, where I am in in spending the ARPA grant right now. Okay, I see um, uh, Philip's um, hand up. Yeah, I was just going to add in that conversation that I think that if you ask Ray kind of where he is currently right now in his office. He will share that uh, he is currently in the middle school for his space, um, as well as DEI is at the bank center. Cress is at the bank center. The senior center is at the bank center. So I think speaking to your point of space, I think space is for sure an issue um, for these programs and then a creation of a whole another program. And so with that, I think that talking about the feasibility study to kind of maybe see what we can redirect space to, to free up some areas, to then have some space. I think that that conversation is larger than any of our departments that we are currently a part of right now. Okay. Well, I, I guess the, the other thing, like I said, though, is that, um, you know, one way or another, though, we are going to continue to ask these questions and we're going to continue to uh, put the pressure on the town um, to, um, you know, monitor this very closely. And so whether it is you all, you know, ask us to have a member in these conversations with the town personnel, or we will continue to, to, to ask the town manager as well as, um, you know, continue to invite staff in to talk to us because, you know, like I said, this is a central, central recommendation of the CSWG. And so it's a central, central um, um, part of what CSSJC is is about and 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 should be monitoring. Um, so, uh, but I understand that you all don't have the answers, and so we are in dialogue with the town manager, and you know we we've, we've sent him follow up questions and comments, which he said he's going to uh, be responding um, to us in the next few days. I I, I would assume, right? So. Um, so this dialogue is going to continue. And my thing is, again, I'm, I'm putting it out there for the town. I mean, come on, be transparent. You know, have us in the loop. Have us in the conversation. It's, it, it, 
it just doesn't work the way that 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 the town works right <laughs> which is <laughs> which is hide the ball <laughs> um the hide the ball method is not good hide the ball method is 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 never a good method it's a bad method <laughs> and so the, the the best method is the conversate and 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 communicate and share share information that's the best method um and so um yeah but thank you ray i, I, I hear it. it and so just real quick i i hear you on that just know number one do follow up do you know, uh, bring your questions to paul um town manager has the ability to answer questions that i don't have the ability to answer uh and i don't want to speak out of turn um, i will tell you that uh, in terms of that transparency, I, I'm transparent to a fault. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, I need you to know that one of the reasons why, why, I, 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 there's a bunch of things I'd love to share with you, uh, but they're not on point. And and transparency sometimes is read as commitment. And I'm and I will tell you that, in, and this isn't the last conversation I'm going to be having with the CSSJC and you, Deborah, or what have you. But but transparency sometimes is read as commitment. Uh, you know, my transparency is a lot of times uh, it's it's hey, I don't think this is going to happen, and that seems like a commitment. It's done. Or transparency sometimes feels or is read as my ambition, my hopes, and my dreams, and my vision for a youth empowerment center, which I get just as motivated about as as that CSWG did, which you were involved in. Um, I get I get similarly motivated in those situations, and I don't want that 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 that. Uh, that starry-eyed optimism to be read as commitment either, and that's that's where I just need you to understand me as somebody who's going to be involved in this in this process. Well, thank you, really appreciate it, and thank you for taking the time out of um, your evening and agreeing to talk with us. Um, definitely very appreciative of it. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you. you too. Move on to the CRUS update. And I, I guess I, I want to just kind of interject real quickly before CRUS update. Um, Camille, um, I had um, sent some questions to the town manager in terms of just um, CSSJC. So one, like note taking for our minutes, because minutes are very important for our um our meeting, we need to have minutes. So I'm not sure what, what's happening with that. Two, um, posting of our agenda, you know, that those have been happening like, you know, you know, the night before, two days before, what have you. So I, we, I really want us to get on a, you know, a schedule of, okay, the minutes are good. I mean, the, the agenda is going to be posted by this date so that then we can have the agenda ready by this date. And so then, you know, Things and and we're going to talk about the reports and so we can have the agenda with the reports connected by this date so that then it's posted um and then like i said we need some minutes because then i know that obviously the the recording gets posted later and that's not within your bailiwick i know but it, it gets posted later so uh, you know allegra and i just want it we're, we're the co-chairs of of, of CSAJC, so we we need I, and i understand that right jennifer left and and left a big hole and 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 we haven't had any type of real consistency in regards to it since then. But I, I do want us to have some consistency. So so do you have any um kind of responses to that in terms of minutes and 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 by when our 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 agendas can be posted so that then as co-chairs we can get agenda items? Sure, not a problem. Okay, for as far as the postings, um, just so you know, uh, the town has it set up or and I'm not sure where it is, but has to be done 48 hours in advance, the posting to be put up, which would be since the um, meetings are Wednesday at 630 means they must be done Monday at 630 by 630 p.m. Okay. Um, we have yes by Monday. So by when? By by when? Okay, so that's what by when it needs to be posted. So should we get it to you like let's say the Friday before? So if we get it to you by well, the Friday. Okay, so I'm trying to work now on getting them the the idea behind this before was trying to get them up and posted for Friday. Okay, okay. this week. Yeah. 
yeah. So Friday would be better. So if you got it to Thursday, Friday would be better. Okay, so, so we'll get it to you all by Thursday then. Yes. By Thursday? Okay. Okay. The Thursday of the, the, the previous week. Great. Thank yes. you. Okay. And as I stated in my email, I have delegated the um the minutes, okay, uh to um uh staff. So uh Angel, who is our administrative assistant. So oh so he's he's basically listening she, to the meeting. She, and, oh she, sorry. Yes, uh, so she's okay. listening to the meeting and then uh, taking notes and then we'll we'll be she kind will of get she will get the the um we'll get the meeting tomorrow tomorrow or Friday and we'll be able to do the minutes from the recordings. Oh okay. She'll do the minutes from the recording. Okay. Yes. And then um and then usually though we adopt the the minutes, but you know, I don't know if we need to formally do that. <laughs> um, I guess we can just kind of talk more internally because the other part could be that you could just kind of as long as um Angel kind of sent us the minutes, let's say, like after the minutes are done, if if she shared it with us, then if we had any corrections, right? Because that's the only thing. If we had any corrections to it, then we could just submit it to her. Because I don't like all these Robert's rules of this and that. So um, submit it to you, I guess, or, or, or to, you know, to you. And then those corrections could be made. And then we could just post them. Um, no. Honestly, I don't know because I've never posted the minutes. So I would have to find out about that. Minutes, minutes have to be voted in. Oh, they do? Okay. Yeah. All right, so then what we That's need good to for do me to know. is, okay, so then what we need to do is to, by the next meeting then, um, well, if, if once once Angel has it has it done, send it to us so we can review it. And then by the next meeting, we can, what, say if we have any corrections? What, what's what's the Robert, think, what does Robert say, Philip? I think <laughs> that they used to be in our packet, right? Like at when when things were, running smoothly with minutes regularly they would come in the packet and we would have an agenda item at the top that was like approve minutes but right. the only thing allegra is what i'm saying is that I, I would want it because even that didn't run as smooth like in terms of like sometimes we would get it and especially if it's like well i guess if we post it on thursday if we if we if it gets posted on friday then yeah we'll have enough time to read it and then vote on it. Okay, yeah. If we do it like that, if we if we again if we're um, posting everything with our packet and the minutes are included in the packet on Friday, then we'll have enough time to review it and then vote on it on Wednesday. That's how we we could do it. That's how you could do it. And also, um, I'm trying to choose my words very wisely here because I've been recorded and there's mass law that I have to follow and all that. Uh, as a committee, you all cannot communicate together to an email, of course, yeah. individually to an email to someone that is correcting minutes, maybe done so, and then voted in. So if you have any corrections, I would just suggest not to do it to the larger group, rather just to the individual doing the minutes. No, but that's what we're saying, uh, Philip. So we're taking out the corrections because since we're now, you know, we got to do all these, you know, things mm -hmm. that, that you've stated. So what we'll do is that we'll include it in the packet it, it gets posted on Friday. We'll review it. And then if there's corrections, we'll discuss it at the meeting on Wednesday. Okay. We'll mm -hmm. discuss it so that but there will be no discussions between when it gets posted and when, when we meet on Wednesday. Perfect. Everald. I, I was going to say that is what we would do is if either of us find an error, we discuss it publicly at the meeting and correct it on the record. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll do it like that. All right. So in terms of, because I know last time we had talked about having question, you know, a kind of a template to work off of, and we did not chain, we, we, people sent suggestions and I compiled it into a document. Um, remember, remember they sent it just to, well, it was one, yeah. to the two of us. So yeah, it wasn't yeah. like, yeah. Um, so our hope was that that also would be included in the packet that that if that was the template that Cress and D I were working off of in terms of giving us updates that would be from the template that we had come up with 
collectively individually well, <laughs> actually edgy could you could you post that like the proposed format because uh, camille i guess we're going into the next piece which is around crests and everything uh -huh. so, as what allegra is stating right we sent out this and, and all of us at CSSGC is in agreement with this, that we sent out a format in terms of how we want the monthly updates. So we do want something in writing um, that we want okay. to be included in the um, in the packet. So if we're sending everything in by Thursday, our agenda, we want like the CRESS uh, written up update uh, as well as DI, and we'll talk with Philip later, DI mm -hmm. written update to be part of the packet. <laughs> And then, and then, like this, we 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 can then have it as part of the the report. So, um, had, yeah. I, will, I will let you know now. Um, I have passed that on along to the town manager. Okay, to discuss because that is a lot of information and a PowerPoint included. Okay, so I have passed that on to the town manager, and I am waiting for a response to from him um, as far as when moving forward with this. So, um, so if the PowerPoint is the issue, you don't have to do the PowerPoint. That's fine. But we we definitely need we to do break generally down. with meetings and giving a oral presentation of the what we're doing on. Um, there is a lot of stuff you've got here, and this is basically, um, like I said, I spoke to, you know, emailed the town manager, and I'm waiting for information back. Before I make any but, comment but on, wait, but, but so Camille, happen. I want to, I want, so we want to explain what what it is, why it is that we we're asking for these, mm -hmm. right? So we're asking for this information because one, Crest is is a department that is the mission is to be an alternative to policing. So these questions and these categories that we're we're asking for over here is actually the categories that were. Um, discussed through the leap that that did that original um, analysis in terms of what are the the different areas that Crest should be uh, responding to. So a lot of like that information that we've been given in the past, it really doesn't make too much sense to us. These categories actually will make sense to us, and if we're able to see it right. If it's able to be like in a graph and it's able to even like Evro had said, if it was in an Excel spreadsheet, right, where then you can kind of and we can see it side by side on a month to month basis, it would make more sense to us as as a committee. And we want data that makes sense. We don't want data that just for data's sake. If it's just for data's so sake, what's the point of it? That, right? is a, that is a very valid point, And that is one of the reasons why we are working on our data set so that it will be easier to pull this kind of data and actually make it more easily read, readable. Um, one of the things that we're doing is, again, I've said this before about working with Qualtrics on making our how in defining what our parameters are for our data. So in this way, once Qualtrics is set, it will be much easier to pull the data and give charts and whatnot versus what's going on now, which is we're still working on it by hand. So a lot of this information, you know, we have some of it, but along with our standard operating procedures, this is something that is in the midst of. It is not completed. Yeah, no, I, I get that. But the thing is, is that, you know, that's something that's been that's been going on even before you came. Uh, Pamela, when she was part of the interim team and leading the interim team, we were told that we were going to get data. That never happened. Um, okay. So so I, I can stop you for a minute here. One second. OK, so I just want to say a couple of things. Um, this week marks six months that I've been with the department. OK, six months. And the first couple of months were just getting to know what's going on with the department, who are our consumers, our neighbors, et cetera, and learning more about Amherst and what its needs are, okay? So it has only been in the last two months, three months, that I've really been able to sit down and work on some of the things that I had decided I wanted to work on when I came in. And one of those was the standard operating procedures, okay? Now, a lot of things that are going on, like we had the GPL, the Government Performance Lab, that came in before I did, okay, as part of the grant. And some of the things that they had asked for were 
um, how we were going about things. And one of the things that was not set in writing, et cetera, was a very cl clear cut um, standard operating procedures, okay, and how things were going with press. And that's one of the things that we're working on now. The other thing that we're working on is finishing up for last DPH grant, the EAPS grant, okay? And one of the things that just came out today, and actually they were talking to us about, is that we need to have very clear cut standard operating procedures that are developed so that they can be implemented. Now, a lot of the things that we're doing are based on some of the things that I've already been working on. So the standard operating procedures are taking a lot of time. And these are things that are building the bricks to making this a sustainable department. Because that's one of the things that I noticed when I came in that a lot of the things that were not most things were not put into place okay um and it it was just a lot of things that needed to be done and that's what i'm bringing to it is some structure some order and some discipline making sure that all the things that should be put in place a lot of the things that were in the original report and the leap report i wanted to make sure that those things get done so that's what i'm talking about why all this stuff i've only been here for six months and only now really getting to the nitty gritty of what needed to be done. So I, I know that Avril has his hand up and then I can can follow up. Avril? Thank you. So um, Camille, the, the, the intent here is to not give you or your team additional work. So if I may just ask some simplified questions around what we're asking for. Um, the the origin of your report from whatever systems that you have, um, does it come to you in by any chance in any Microsoft program like Excel, Word, Adobe, one of those by any chance? A lot of it right now is coming in in a couple of different ways. And what we're trying to do with Qualtrics, okay, that is the meaning of Qualtrics, is really get everything together. Because one of the problems we're having is um, the difference between qualitative and quantitative data, okay? And for those who don't know, quantitative data is the numbers. And it's really easy to see numbers, okay, that we went to 10 calls this week that encompass this many people. But what quantitative data does not tell is the whole story, which is the quality of it, the qualitative data, which is that we met with a neighbor um, who was having difficulty with um, obtaining food. So we were able to write them um, a Salvation Army voucher to go get some food. Or they lost some items and weren't able or moving into their own apartment and don't have furniture. We were able to write them a voucher and then take them, you know, to stop and shop, or excuse me, big Y to get food. Those are the things that are not captured in our data the way it is set up now. So those are the type of things that we're working on because I want people, I want the, the uh, committee to be able to see a very full and robust um, data set. So if I understand you, you're getting information from different sources and you have to piece them together. Yes. So that's the problem right now is that piecing them all together. So it's not an accurate representation. I mean, if you compile all this data, you know, um, what I'm looking for, and this is what Qualtrics is supposed to be able to help us do, and they're still in the process of it, is get all this data in something that's manageable and that's easily readable, and that will be a lot easier to present than what I've had to. And so, again, I don't want to give you or your team any additional work, so let me just ask this question. Is there anything that would prevent you from say sending me the raw data so I can play around with it to see if I can help in any way to put this maybe in an Excel format and then report back to you as to how I did that and see if that's something that you guys can use or be interested in. So we do have some in Excel, but again, it's not the, the, 
what has happened was previously was the data was corrupted. So that's why all this stuff is being reformatted. So that's the difference. In the last couple of months, we're really trying to streamline things. That's why I say that, you know, um, that it's not being done at present. Okay. So again, so when I made, when the last things that I gave you a couple months ago took a long time to get together. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to help if I can to, um, I, I do like Excel. I, if there's, you know, if you want to send me anything and I can play around with it and maybe build a template that may work for you, that may not work for you. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. We can discuss it. Okay. you say is kind of like what the committee is hoping for is that we do get a more robust picture of what's going on because like you said just hearing raw numbers doesn't really mean much other than like oh you know I can do math and they did more than last month or whatever um right so and that I, I, the I, problem is is that you know just by the numbers the numbers don't accurately show all the stuff that we're doing right you know um like one of the things we were talking about, I, I was talking to the responders today about this. And, you know, one of the things that they mentioned that um, we, the big thing is that we speak to the people who have been forgotten and overlooked. Okay. And that when we engage with these neighbors, they're the ones that tell us that they are disappointed in the community as a whole. And like, I really want to get, people to understand that it takes time to build trust and that we are starting small. Um, I know that Allegra, you had sent me some information before about Durham, um, North Carolina. And one of the things that Durham did is that they did a data set for three years um, before they even piloted their program. And then the other thing about it is, is that they had a lot of information and services and everything set up. Also, the other thing about um, Durham is that their program has four tiers, okay? And two of their tiers are like responders, and then they have a group um, called the, they have, um, community response team, and then one of the other parts is a care navigator, which provides additional support after. So in Crest, we are both. So that takes up additional part of our time is that not only do we meet people where they're at, but after this, okay, after we see them, a lot of times there's a lot of follow-up that goes along with this. So the numbers just, tell a part of the story. And I really want people to understand that there's so much more to the story than just the numbers. So again, I think that we're kind of on the same page about that, which is why like on the second page, we were talking more about kind of individual case highlights. Cause I think when we were getting those, it was more helpful to kind of conceptualize what it means when you see that there have been assist citizen calls, for example. Um, and, and I will say, I think we also wanted to make sure that we're tracking progress towards what kinds of call types are being added into the repertoire based on what was identified previously by the LEAP report when conceptualizing CRESS. So like, right. so like from here up is kind of like what already was, you know, what we saw from you last, last report mm -hmm. and then kind of from here down is the stuff that we were hoping to add in. And I think, I think one of the things about location is just kind of understanding what kind of area you guys are covering in any given day. Um, is it mostly centralized or is it spreading out into some of the other neighborhoods? And Actually, I don't even know if we are, if that is actual location. I know we have them through the CADs mm -hmm. of where everything is, like where 
folks are going. Um, but I have to check and see if it's actually um, part of our data collection of what section. I know I had a note about that. And again, since we are consent based, I was looking like the demographics. Um, the only thing we can go on is, um, you know, what people tell us, mm -hmm. okay, or else um, phenotype what we see or what we perceive. Um, and as you know, what, um, how someone looks uh, according to um, race may not be what they actually are. We understand that. So, uh, I, it, you know, uh, like again, we, we do understand that there's been kind of like issues around um, getting the data and things like that um, or, or displaying the data, I guess, because there's this, platform or what have you that 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 you all are trying to get or going to get or, 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 or you know not sure but it's just kind of like you know we 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 are very you know we want to know like what is actually what is crest actually handling and of course if what crest is handling falls within the parameters of um alternative to policing which again is the, the the focus of Crest, right? And I understand that Crest is involved in a variety of different things, but again, I want to put out my my concern, which is, you know, the fact the mission of Crest, right? Which right now I'm not sure where Crest is at in terms of its mission, right? Um, and and even though you know, seems like seemingly they're, they're doing a bunch of things, but what are they doing that actually falls within alternative to, to policing, right? Which is dealing with some of those things that we stated in this report, which was actually within the LEAP report, which is all the nonviolent um, type of categories um, that need to be there. Because, you know, we're very intentional when we created um, and recommended Crest for it not to be a social service agency. So, you know. Well, one and, of the things you have to understand is that we are not a social service agency, but what I see us as a bridge. So if you, again, one of the things that was very much um, talked about was Durham. If you look at how they originally were formed and what their original mission was and how things have evolved, there's a lot of evolving with alternatives to policing, okay, alternative response. So when I talk to people and we talk about, you know, what do we do? It is any call pretty much that doesn't require it, that you wouldn't want necessary police or fire. So the same thing of like, if you're having difficulty with your neighbor or um, you have, if you're a business and there is someone that is there that, you know, is being loud or having, you know, um, not necessarily a mental health crisis, but just having a difficult day. And, um, or like at the library where they're very open to having unhoused folks, you know, who are there during the day. Now, if they get disruptive or something, Crest will come and speak to them. And a lot of times what's happened is, is as I said, is building this trust that people are saying, this is the first time that somebody's actually li listened to me. Or they've come to us because they're having a lot of problems. And they said, this is the first time that I actually feel hope. You're actually listening to me. You're actually you know, helping me to find somebody to give me help, okay? Whereas these same people could be out on the street um, causing difficulty for people, okay, and things like that. Um, another thing I think of is during the block party. Um, if you notice, I think, um, Deborah, you were there and Lisette was there. I don't notice, know if you noticed that there was a gentleman there who was having difficulty, he is unhoused, and there is another person who is unhoused, who the two of them were getting into um, an argument. And 
he came up to Crest because he didn't want to involve the police. And we spoke to both of them. And he came over and spoke to um, our team for probably 45 minutes to an hour. And what he said was, is that he didn't want to get violent with this person. And he appreciated the fact that we took the time to speak with him and de-escalate the situation. So that's what I feel is Cress's mission. It's to be there to help when people don't necessarily want the police, okay, and need someone there. Another thing that happened at the block party, I don't know if you know, is that there was a missing child. And we had a picture of the child and everyone went off, you know, it's every all hands on deck. Everyone went looking for this child. And one of the responders found the child. Turns out the child was with the mother. And he showed the picture of the child to the mother and goes, yeah, that's my, you know, she was wearing the same outfit. Um, he said, okay, there's been some, you know, confusion here. Can you come back with us back to the fire station um, where the sitter was? So the sitter was very upset and they were like, okay. And it turns out, but what I, the main point I want to bring to this year is that as a person of color who would have probably been much more upset if a police officer had walked up to them and said, hey, can you come with us? I think there's some misunderstanding. They would have felt obliged to do it. There would have been a lot of fear or whatnot. But instead, our crest responder was able to say, hey, you know, well, you know, we're trying to figure out this. Do you mind coming back and talking? You know, came back and everything was cleared up. That is a crest response. It is a lot easier for someone to see us in our gray and talk to us versus speaking to a police officer. Somebody else is having difficulty, they will come to us if they see us. So along with the mission, I think that it's a lot more than just being there instead of the police. I, I agree with that, Camille. I mean, obviously some of these um, situations that arose, it's wonderful that Crest was there and I'm happy that Crest was able to help or de-escalate. That is part of their mission. But like I said, part of their mission, right? So dispatch, you know, um, you know, the 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 calls that that are coming into to the police that actually Crest should be handling, you know, is that actually handling is Crest um handling noise complaints? Is Crest handling uh, disturbances that that don't that are non-criminal? Is Crest ha handling suspicious behavior that are non-criminal that go over to the police? There's a variety of other um um arenas and areas that Crest could be involved in, but it's not yes. right. So, so that's again, not happening. That's not so happening. So here's here's the thing you have to understand again is when I was talking about standard operating procedures. Okay, one of the things that I think that you're having difficulty understanding is the fact that police and fire have over 200. Well, Amherst has over 200 years of police and fire. So their standard operating procedures have been built over 200 years. Crest has only been in existence since, um, well, they went live September of 2022. Okay. So that's been two years. There were no standard operating procedures. There were nothing in writing. There was nothing working with dispatch police, et cetera, that gave us a, um, a foundation was not there. So even though, um, uh, oof, no, it hasn't been a year, uh, December of last year, they went on dispatch. There was nothing set up for dispatch to know what Crest Calls went to. Also, again, as I've said, I'm working very closely with dispatch to set up these standard operating procedures, but they take time. Again, 200 years of what's been going on and they already have that well-documented, well-set. But we have to take all of these things that are going into it and go through each one of them and figure out how are we going to do this? Okay. This is a well-being check, all right? I know that this person or dispatch knows that this person has this much difficulty and if confronted or whatnot, depending on how they're feeling, you know, they could get violent, 
okay? They know all these things. Now, the way it comes up in the reports or whatnot, you see in the paper or whatnot, just a disturbance. But again, it doesn't show the nuances. So that's where training comes in. That's where it comes in, where working with dispatch, you know, on their operating procedures and on ours makes a difference. I wouldn't want to just send people out on something without having a good base and knowledge. So that's part of training. And I really want to standardize all these things. So that's why I was brought in, because I know about building programs. So that's where this is coming from. It is a program that is being built from the base, the foundation up. These are things that were not put in place before and with the first director at all. The, in, um, the uh, team, okay, in between didn't feel it was right to put into place all these things when a director was coming in that would set this up. So there were some things that were started and now I'm making sure that they are fulfilled and done right. I don't wanna just do something. That is why so many of these programs had pilots to make sure that everything that they had was in place. So there is where the difference is. And I understand that all these different calls, but you have to start with the one call, then go to the second call. And it has to be very clear. And as someone who is in law, you know that there are too many things in this litigious society that we have to worry about. So I wanna make sure that it, people are our call types, that the language we're using, and that's something else, the language we're using has to be the same as police and fire. OK, these are community responders, so they all have to be trained to the same level. And that's what I'm doing with people is making sure that we're all on the same page, that the training is the same so that when we do, as we call them, warm handoffs, that people understand that we're all working together. And I want town departments and everything else. It is all about collaboration. Yeah, I get that. I get that, Camille, for sure. Um, but, I, you know, I understand that it takes time. But if you're telling me that it's going to take 200 years. <laughs> it's not going to take 200 years. All it's, I'm saying is that it's 200 years it's been set up. And the other part of this, and the other part you have to understand, and I think you do understand this part, is that taking things that are coming down from a police-based um mindset, okay, and having to turn them into a trauma-informed, um, uh, anti-racist lens, you know, that's a whole nother level that we have to add to it. And what um, my um, uh, implementation manager calls it is we're taking all these things and we have to crestify them. So we have to make sure when we do these that they are trauma-informed, anti-racist. We need to make sure that we are all speaking language that is um, not, you know, going to cause harm. Um, so again, it, it's, I know it just seems like it's, it's a lot. And over the last, you know, couple of months, I've really, you know, wore myself out going over a lot of these things because I do believe in this work. You know, I wouldn't have come here if I didn't. So, but it's all, it's all taking time and it's a lot of work. And I mean, this is something that, you know, I love, I love doing this and I love setting this up and, you know, it, it's when it's done. The other part of this is, is that, um, as Ray alluded to, um, well, talk, he didn't allude to, he made clear, is that I want this to be sustainable. And the way it was set up, okay, was not necessarily sustainable. And definitely, you know, coming from um, first responder, being a firefighter and having been the training officer, I understand how important it is that everybody is trained to the same level, that everybody is on the same page, OK, so that we all understand what is going on. And that is why when I report out things, I want to make sure that it is in language that everyone understands and that if there's questions that 
they're easily answered. I definitely get that. Um, do, do we know um, uh, how, how, well, you, you know, how many responders are in place right now? We have four. And um, mm -hmm. this week we are interviewing for responders. So we have a diverse candidate pool. Um, and actually it's starting tomorrow. So I'm excited. So then in terms of like, like timelines, deadlines, in terms of like, so the, the data that we're requesting and, and things like that, um, what do you think? Given well, the, the standard operating procedures and so on and so forth. That is going to so, and that is, you know, um, I have somebody working diligently on that and a lot of, um, a lot of traction has really gotten on that. Um, I don't know if you know this, I didn't know this, but, um, well, I yeah, kind of when I think about it. Um, when you start a job, a lot of times the first thing you're done is given a manual, okay? And it has like, you know, your, I mean, like a regular job, you would get like your time off, your sick, et cetera, and how to do this. So R1 is much more in depth. You know, it's um, our policies and procedures, um, what to do if this happens, how to deal with this, et cetera. Um, also, it will have, um, as we're right now setting up training for the new responders. And, um, and that's one of the things that I was working on this week with the responders is finding out what trainings that they had over the last two years that they felt were beneficial to them okay um what they felt was not and what they feel like they needed so i'm getting a comprehensive list of that and that is what's helping to build the training out so um and i'm hoping that we can really get all this stuff done you know before the end of the year i mean like the training comprehensive training set up um get the data all set you know, um, and work with Qualtrics and be able to have something that, that makes sense, is sustainable, um, and can be expanded upon, you know, I mean, there's a lot that we're doing, but it, it needs to be scalable. So, uh, my final thoughts, because I, I actually have to jump off at 830, um, so I won't be able to say on, but beyond that, but my final thoughts in terms of this, in terms of some of the things that you said, um, before the CSSJC members jump in with questions is, you know, and and I do get like Cress obviously being on the same page, speaking the same language as a fire department and, and the APD so that they can communicate. But again, just making sure that Cress is independent, like you said, right? Oh, and definitely. And is, is focused on being anti-racist and being, um, you know, about de-escalation and trauma-informed and everything, even though APD and fire department should also be anti-racist and should also be, you know, focused on, you know, making sure that they have responses that are, are more so trauma-informed and then, you know, Crest dealing with all the other, you know, aspects so that they're all in line, right? So even if they're dealing with things, it should still be anti-racist, it should still be, you know, a, a trauma-informed, even though they're dealing with, you know, violent, criminal, possible behaviors and you all are dealing with hopefully not all the other nonviolent behaviors mm -hmm. right so both should still be kind of responding in that way and then you all have the added the escalation and communication and conversation and all those other aspects of it but yeah i think it's kind of like that that common language to a certain extent goes both ways right in terms of of, of some of the things that the the police also need to be focusing on and, and the fire department need to be focusing on, especially, you know, and that was one of the things that I asked, right? right? One of the questions I asked to Chief Ting was, how are you going to make your, your department anti-racist, right? So, um, and I think I was going to say, and that's one of the things that um, Chief Ting and I have talked about. And also, as you know, they're um, looking for the new fire chief. So that is one of the things is working collaboratively with them is really encouraging that. And some of the things that we found are some of the um, trainings that we're doing that, you know, um, we're working with um, oh, like uh, motivational interviewing and everything else and finding out a lot of the classes that we're doing 
also the police have and also the fire department has. And Chief Ting has really, you know, encouraged people and he really um, believes in Cress and believes in his people. So, and I think one of the things that's really nice that's happening now is that we are getting referrals from police officers that are out in the community and seeing things and realizing, you know what, this is not us, you know, have Crest come out here. And I mean, I think it's wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate you responding to my questions. Thank you. Other folks, questions? So now we can uh, move on to DEI. Yeah, why don't we do that? No, um, I think for the sake of time, because I know, Deb, you just said that you have to jump off. Um, yeah, but other members are going to stay on. I'm going to jump off. But... Right, I just want to make um, one announcement since all members are here um, and then whoever comes on is that um, in terms of resident oversight board, I would like to just say that um, if not this morning, definitely um, in the afternoon, a uh, contract has been signed to move forward with the consultant in that way. Um, the consultant is being notified, so I will not publicly state it right now because I just feel like that's not fair to tell <laughs> you all who it is before they get that information. Um, but they will get that information by the end of tonight, if not have already. I just don't know that communication on that way. Um, in terms of moving forward, the first step that um, Paul would like to do is create, and with the consultants, is create kind of a group that will be looking at bylaws um, for the resident oversight board and moving forward. So this group, um, per Paul's kind of direction, is going to encompass um, CRESS, DEI, uh the human rights commission and cssjc as well as hr and of course the town manager's office and in terms of scope and scale of kind of the size of the group i think that he's moving towards the direction of one representative for each group just so that way with schedules timing and for sake of not moving the project any longer than it has already taken that it would just like to just kind of be moved up in that way um, in terms of the consultants they would like to kind of host um, the CSJC as well as the Human Rights Commission into kind of a public forum if you will um, of kind of scope what it is that um, the oversight board happening everything in that way um, obviously I'll let the consultants speak for themselves when they um, do so but the idea of the plan is, and of course this is a plan, so things can change. And as I just said, this is just news that was given to me a few hours before I hopped on this call is that um, in November, um, the hope is to have that meeting with the CSSJC and HRC to host kind of that. And then an individual from both of your all groups, I think Paul will just appoint individuals from um, the groups in town. I'm not sure if he's looking to directors to appoint it. I can't speak to that, but someone from the town groups will be appointed in that way. Um, so November meeting kind of a scope what it's going to look like. And then you all decide who is that representative from your all groups. And I recognize that you're going to have new members as well. So, um, but I just wanted to give that news before you hop off the call. Cause I know that that is a, uh, um, priority that has or initiative that has been wanting some details on that. So good news in that way of it is moving forward. Great news. Very excited. And on that note, I'll bid you all farewell. And um, then uh, Allegra, then you can fill me in on anything I miss. <laughs> all right. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, Yep, so I just wanted to give that update. Um, and then apologies for not getting anything to you all. I will recognize that I did not. I think the email chain is out there. Um, I received the information, I believe, on the 30th um, from you all to request that information. Some of this information, as I just said, I didn't have an update until about 12 o'clock today to give you. So my update for Monday would have definitely changed from my update today. So um, apologies. Uh, we are a department of two and at times it is very much felt that way. So um, the trainings that the 
DEI department is doing for town staff. So every third Friday of the month, we have trainings um, for different topics. Last month was kind of a coffee house thing that encompassed a lot of topics, um, particularly race and ethnicity. And this month we're doing um, accessibility and a member from the accessibility committee is hopefully joining us for that conversation to talk with staff. And it's just more of an effort to kind of get staff up to par with things they may not know or see in their department that, you know, it's, it's very interesting being a part of that group. I think that um, not having a disability myself, I see the blind spots in things that are not in my day-to-day -day life that are in someone else's day-to-day -day life that is definitely just eye-opening. So it's in an effort to allow staff to kind of get that feel of what it is that can happen for um, in their departments. In terms of departmental training, we are trying or not trying, we are going to do in January departmental trainings for all departments. And it's going to be um, specialized in every single department. So as you can imagine, the Jones Library is going to be very different than the PDW um, building, our people, as well as the Crest people, as well as the Senior Center. So those trainings will be kind of tailored into categories um, based off of a survey that will go out to staff to kind of get a fill and as, as well as um, to directors kind of what it is needed between various departments. Um, I'm trying to go along on the list of notes that I have written here from you are all um, community engagement. We have, in terms of racial healing, we have a beloved community series that happens every other month on the third Thursday evening. So our last one was dealing with America's racial history. We had about 30 people in attendance. We had um, great conversation that night. I think that um, it really is moving forward in terms of um, people kind of talking about tough issues and especially in particular of race and moving those things along. Um, in terms of the um, resident oversight board, I gave you all kind of that um, information. Um, I don't know when those things will get coordinated and I don't really know who it's fallen under. I imagine it is the DEI department. So when I know more information, you all will know inf more information. Um, I think that in terms of that meeting that the consultants are trying to do, I know that availability is an issue because of the holiday and of course all of your all's holidays. So um, we, are, we are very hopeful that it happens and moves forward in a way that is seen productive for everybody. Um, Just for open meeting law clarification, say in order to plan a date for a forum, that could be done via email because it is meeting slash agenda setting. Right, correct. Okay, so because mm -hmm. I'm just thinking if our next meeting is November 13th, then that really, like for us to plan something between then and right the everything else that goes on in November and December. Is Correct. Yeah. It's, it's getting into the holiday season so. for sure. Um, translation services um, happening. We, so I don't know if you all saw, but we have um, what are called pocket talks. And so those are almost handheld translators that can translate over 80 languages Every town department has it. Um, so it is very nice in a way that, you know, if someone needs help at DEI and we make a handoff to the public health department, they have the equipment also to communicate. So it's not like, oh, DEI has this equipment that we can talk to someone that doesn't speak English, but then someone else that then needs something else then gets handed to a department that it would be unhelpful for. So those devices are all in town hall, um, various amounts of town staff from our planning, press, police, um, DEI office, the Jones. A lot of people are using them and saying they work fantastic, that we're able to help out people. They also do um, translation of scan documents in there. So it is very helpful, as you can imagine, for some translation that gets tough for government work um, and language that it then is an easy way to communicate and translate for individuals. Um, in that way, the 
communications manager um, is new into her role and she is working with various departments for translation. Um, I know one thing that they're working on is with DPW and some signage. Um, so, I mean, that's going to be great in itself. We all use public works, public spaces that if you are a non-English speaker, it's probably very difficult to understand what the sign is saying if you have no idea. So um, in that way, that's moving forward. I am being a part of a language access roundtable that's going to um, discuss other municipalities that kind of have already established translation services in their town and kind of what has worked for them, what has not worked for them. And so that happens on, uh, later on this month. So translation services, I, I think is moving in a great direction for the town in terms of accessibility. And then um, I think the big topic that we kind of discovered or discussed firsthand in the beginning of our meeting is youth um, programming in terms of DEI. So we are taking some initiative in the DEI office to have some youth programming specifically focused on empowerment. And so I think Ray alluded to one of them that um, this is just speaking to the town's collaboration aspect of things. I think that um, the entrepreneurship area is an idea that came from the DEI office that REC then is now helping work out. And as well as um, Cress Cremil is very great and amazing in the collaboration aspect of things that it's now, the concept that happened at DEI is now being fill, filled through three departments and possibly the Jones Library that then will help out in a way to have kind of a junior market at our um, global village festival which is a festival that's happening in place of kind of um, the various town events that we've done in the past um, it's in a direction that the human rights commission is really pushing forward that it's a lot of work to do all these individual celebrations and not um, taking away of the fact that these celebrations need to happen and or be recognized. It's just more of a feasible, equitable way of doing so because attendance varies at very different celebrations as well as cost, as well as just the effort that goes into it. So on an equity issue, we are trying to then incorporate one event that will happen um, in April that then will be coupled with some youth empowerment. And I will say I that I have reached out to, um, uh, I think I could say, I, I couldn't see if there being a problem. I reached out to the Black Business Association of Amherst for some um, help in that way. Um, we are in talks. There's no commitment on their end. Uh, it is just simple, just talks in that way. But in an effort to bring everybody together that creates kind of the idea of um, youth empowerment with the focus on BIPOC youth as well and that. So that is one avenue. There's a couple of other workshops um, that we're thinking of doing in terms of empowerment. And then I will also say that I would love any input from this committee as well as any people that you know that could possibly help out in this avenue. Um, I have already had, I think, three, four, about to be five meetings with community members um, from various areas um, in the community. So I think that that is one benefit for me um, taking this position is that I kind of know some stakeholders and can make a phone call and have a meeting in that way. But if you all think that I should be talking to someone that I have not talked to, please let me know. Um, as well as if you all think of any um, workshops that may be great. And of course we are 100% listening to youth in ways that we are in the schools, talking to the schools, trying to get information that has already been said, as Ray has said, that um, some youth at Morning Movement kind of discuss in terms of empowerment in programs. And so that's kind of where the entrepreneurship idea actually came from was that Ray brought it up to me. I was like, this would be great. And I think that it's no secret that I have an eighth grader myself who very much um, I think is an entrepreneur, but just needs those kind of skill sets of to like, okay, what happens after you have the idea? Like what are the next steps? And those things will just come into place. I think Can I ask a clarifying question? Yep. So this envisioned event for April, mm -hmm. is that, are you saying that's in place of things that DEI has sponsored in the past, like the Lunar New Year and Juneteenth and? 
Right, that is, that is correct. It's going to be in place of it. We are still doing um, partnerships with individuals. So like for um, Latinx Heritage Month, um, Salsa in the Park had a celebration there. We were able to help them kind of navigate food trucks and different um, avenues in that way. So we are still working with groups to highlight celebrations. We are just not taking on the initiative of doing that celebration. So same thing with the Festival of Lights. Um, Dalani Shalmels is um, in talks with me of doing so. I have helped out with the proclamation and I believe we're going to be highlighting some crafts in that way. So we, again, these celebrations need to be recognized and it's definitely a time for that. I think for sustainability of the celebrations um, when I was on the Human Rights Commission and now the Human Rights Commission, that is, it, it just, it takes up a lot of time and a lot of effort that I think that our department just cannot feasibly do in the long term. Of language access, it's great to hear that it's available in all the departments and um, and that there's going to be potentially some signage in other languages as well. Is there any talk about like meeting translation or Zoom accessibility for other languages? Right. So I know that is but... right. I know that is being um, looked into. I I don't know anywhere that it has gone. I know that um, very different avenues have been looked into for um, lang language translations, and I believe that Zoom itself does have a component of it. I do think that there is some issues with it, and I can't really speak to what those issues are right now that the holdup is there. Regarding the DEI updates. I have no questions, but thank you, Philip. That was very detailed. All right. If DEI is dying, is dying. Oh, what is happening? Is that me? Sorry, everybody. I was just saying. I was just saying that if DEI is done, I am going to go eat with my son. Thank you, everybody. Um, appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Philip. Um. So Deborah and I did send a follow-up email to Paul. I know she referenced that earlier. Um, just ask, kind of asking for some clarification on the questions we had sent earlier. Um, so there's no update from him. We were just, I, and a lot of the questions actually were questions that Deborah asked Ray. So I think hopefully by also asking them to Paul, perhaps we'll get some sort of answer. Um, so on the, the next thing on the agenda is discussion of goals. Um, I'm wondering how people would feel about tabling that until next month when we have a new member or if people have anything that they really have as a burning desire for a goal. Um, I think it makes sense given that it's only three of us left. <laughs> um, okay, so we can table that. And then we also had presenting at a town council meeting as an agenda item. Um, that is something Deborah and I had talked about from one of the suggestions from public comment last time we met. Um, so that is something that we can reach out to the town council president about potentially getting on an agenda. Um, I think it could be helpful to do so in the context of the budget that is coming up. Um, I, I did see there was some question as the town council is starting to talk about budgeting and how to make a budget for next year. And the fact that there will be some shortfalls that Cress was mentioned as a possible place to look at and reassess in terms of budgeting. Um, 
So that could also be tied in with the goals discussion of putting some advocacy into that area, perhaps. Um, so I'm going to put a pin on that as well for next month, if that's okay. Um, we have six members of the public. If anyone wants to make a public comment, please raise your hand. Not seeing any hands raised. feel like we're about to set a record for like the world's quickest CSSJC meeting and no public comment periods. <laughs> um, speak now or wait until November 13th. Um, so our next meeting is November 13th, I believe. Let me just double check the calendar, but I think that's the right date. I've already said it like three times. So if I'm wrong, I apologize. Yeah, it, it is November 13th, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will have a discussion of goals. Um, we have invited the finance director. We have not had confirmation that she will come yet, but perhaps there will be some additional questions around youth empowerment. We have our standing items, uh, town council meeting, anything else anyone would like to add at this time? Not that we made any request for agenda items emailed about a week before. All right, well, it is 8.49. And I am adjourning this meeting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a good, have night. A good night. Bye, you too. Bye.